Today we're going to talk about a particular type of question that is very, very common both for the AA exams and for the AI exams as well. This is about distributions, the normal distribution and the binomial distribution. But this is one of those types of questions that shouldn't surprise you at all when you find it in your exam. And more than that, I think that you should even be looking in your exam for a question like this one because it's that common. It's likely that you will find one and then in that case, it's good because you already know how to do one of them. So I'm talking about questions that start out by describing a situation that is normally distributed. And then halfway through the question, there is also a binomial distribution in the same question that you then have to recognize and do things with. So sometimes these questions will be longer questions and sometimes they will be very short. Let's start with a very short one. It's just five marks, very straightforward. But this question already has all of the elements that I'm trying to highlight from this type of question. So first he will give you something that is a normal distribution. He will say that it's a normal distribution. And in this case, he is giving you the mean and the standard deviation because this is a smaller type of question. In a bigger question, he might ask you to calculate these things as we will see later in this video. But for this one, you have the fact that it's a normal distribution, you have the mean, and you have the standard deviation. So next, in this case, he describes what he means by profit. Profit is being more than a thousand and asks you for the probability of profit. So a very straightforward normal distribution question. You're going to use the normal CDF. But before you do, let's just write down so you should always follow this pattern as for what to write down on paper in these questions that are just type it in the calculator, but write something down on paper as well. Uh, name your random variable. I am calling it X because in this case, the problem didn't give me a name. Then say X is distributed as, and then the normal distribution. This is a good opportunity for you to show that you know how to use proper mathematical notation. Okay, so X, is distributed as a normal. This is the mean, this is the variance. That's why I have the little square there. And then ask the probability question that letter A is asking of you. The probability of the random variable X being bigger than a thousand is, and that's why you need to name it because if it doesn't have a name, if it's not called X or something else, then you don't have anything to put in there inside of the probability question. But after writing that down, you just come into the calculator, go to the distributions menu, put it in your normal CDF. Uh, this is bigger than a thousand that he wants. So the lower bound here is a thousand. The upper bound, there is no upper bound. Timmy can make as much profit as he is fortunate enough to have. So I am going to put the biggest number that I can think of, which is 10 to the power of 99. And then the mean of the distribution was 820. Sigma was 230, which is the standard deviation. And this is the probability. With three significant figures, we're going to call that 0 0.217. And then we get to part B of this question that says the shop is open for 24 days. And remember that everything that happened in part A was daily. It was a daily income. And now we're talking about 24 days. So this is a repetition of an experiment. This is telling you that part B is about binomial distribution. Binomial distribution is about repeating an experiment. And all that you really have to do is to identify in these questions, what is the experiment and what are the repetitions? So for Timmy, the experiment was to open his shop and see how much money he made. And the repetition is to do that every day. Usually when a new number appears in uh, this type of problem, like 24 appeared here, you can already suspect that this is what the number is representing, is a number of repetitions of an experiment so that it's going to be binomial distribution. But of course, look for your repeated experiment as well. And a lot of times in the marking of these questions, you will receive a mark just for recognizing the binomial distribution. So I wrote binomial distribution here in capital letters because I'm trying to be safe and guarantee that I get that mark. But obviously that's not the best way to do it, right? What you should do 
to properly write down the fact that you are recognizing this binomial distribution is to keep writing things down in proper mathematical notation like I had done in part 1a. So you're going to need to name another random variable. You're not going to use x again because x was already used as the income for a given day. So now I'm using y to be the number of days that he has profit because that's what the question is about. Timmy makes a profit on between 5 and 10 days. But then every time I write down a random variable, I should say what its distribution is. And this is the moment where I show them that I have recognized the binomial distribution correctly and putting in both correct parameters for the binomial, okay? Because maybe just recognizing binomial is not enough to get that first mark, but giving the notation of binomial with the correct numbers for n and p, the parameters, then that will give you the mark. So it's always better to use good notation. So the parameters for binomial distributions are the number of repetitions, which in this case is 24. And the second parameter is the probability of success in a given one of those 24 experiments. So in our case, the probability of Timmy having profit, which we have just calculated is 0 0.217. So this is exactly what happens in almost all of these types of questions, okay? So part A, you calculate the probability of something happening in a normal distribution. And then in part B, you recognize a binomial. And that probability that you have just calculated in part A becomes the parameter for the binomial distribution. And then before going back to the calculator, we need to write down what is the probability that we want. Timmy makes a profit on between five and 10 days inclusive. That means it's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If it was exclusive for one of them, then he might begin at six or end at nine. So in terms of the notation, the way that this inclusive translates is that I'm using the less or equal symbols there instead of just the less. And no matter how carefully they try to word these questions so that there is no ambiguity, um, there's always somebody who asks something, and I've heard the question whether the inclusive here is referring to both the 5 and the 10, or if it's referring to just the 10. And I have to agree with the person who asked this question. They really should have said both inclusive, but I can't imagine that they meant anything else other than this. Okay, so before I go to the calculator, I have to figure out what to do with this double inequality, right? The 5 less or equal y less or equal 10, because the button in the calculator only does the probability of y being less or equal to something without the other inequality on the left side. So the y's that he wants are between 5 and 10 inclusive, so these things. Well, if I start by taking y less or equal 10, I'm getting all of these. But then I don't want the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So I can subtract another one that means just 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So that is going to give me just the 5 through 10. So I can rewrite it like that and then go back to my calculator to separately figure out both of those probabilities and then just subtract them in the end. Now, I've seen a lot of people trying to memorize correctly how to do these transformations because the binomial CDF that we are going to use in the calculator requires it to be like variable less or equal. So there's changes that you need to make first in case the symbol in the probability that you're calculating is not the less or equal. If you want the probability of the variable is less than something, if you want the probability of the variable being bigger or equal than something, or just bigger or a more complicated case like this one that involves both sides. And guys, honestly, it is more work to try to memorize each one of these possibilities in the correct way and not make any mistakes ever in the way that you've memorized a bunch of things, that's a lot more work than just understanding the concept that you should draw the number line like I just did, circle the ones that you want, and then try to put them together as something that goes to the left starting from zero. Honestly, 
understanding this concept and drawing a little bit is a lot easier than trying to memorize like five or six different cases of things that look so so similar to each other but right now i want to go to my calculator with these parameters 24 and 0 217 actually i'm not going to use the 217 because the correct number is this one right 217 was three significant figures which is what i put on paper but whenever possible you should use the actual number that your calculator was giving you from the previous item sometimes this is as easy as using the answer button here if you want to continue doing a calculation with that number uh, but right now that's not what we want we want to remember that number and put it as a parameter inside of another menu which is for the binomial cdf so in order to do that there is another very interesting button here which is this one on the bottom left it's called store Put a little arrow, which means that this number is going to go into a name, a variable that you call it. You have many letters here to choose from. I'm going to use the letter A. So now when I go into the menu for the binomial distribution, I'm not going to type 0 0.217 because that contains an approximation error. I'm going to type in A instead, which is not even just these many digits. It has more digits inside the calculator's memory that we're not even seeing. So um, distributions, binome CDF, the number of trials was 24. The probability, like I was saying, was A. And then the X value, we want to do it twice, right? Once for 10 and once for or four so with 10 we're getting this probability and with four we are getting this one now the idea was to do one of them minus the other so i will take this number minus the other one and the answer here is 0 0.613 which is the final answer to this problem Okay, so that was the basic problem structure that i wanted to show you something that begins with describing a normal distribution asks for a probability in there, then describes a repetition of trials. You recognize binomial distribution, use the previously calculated probability as a parameter for that binomial, and then that's it. Now, let's see how much of that problem structure is repeated in the next problem that I have on the screen right now, which is a little bit bigger than the first one. So he is, of course, going to ask more things. But let's see what parts of the structure are the same. So I'm going to begin by naming my random variable. I'm calling it M for male because I know that the problem goes on to insert female cats later on. So I'm going to probably use M and F for those two random variables. So M is the variable that gives me the weight of the male cat. M is distributed as this normal distribution with the parameters that came in the question. And he's asking the proportion of male Persian cats that are between 5.5 and 6.5. So this is a double inequality as well with both sides. But because this is a normal distribution, this is not the complicated situation that we were just dealing with. For a normal distribution, it is very common to have both sides. That's just what the normal CDF button expects to have a lower bound, which is 5.5 and an upper bound, which is 6.5. And also because the normal is a continuous random variable, unlike the binomial, which is discrete. So in this case, it doesn't really matter whether he meant between 5.5 inclusive or not. This really doesn't matter for continuous random variables like the normal distribution. So all that I have to do is put all of those values here. And the answer is 673. That was easy enough. But look what happens next. A group of... 80 male Persian cats. Oh, so now he's repeating the experiment. The experiment was to measure the weight of the cat, and now he's doing it 80 times. So there is a binomial distribution here, or at least there would be if he was asking a probability question like, what is the probability that 10 of those 80 cats weighted this much? But that's not what he's asking though. He's asking the expected number of cats to have a weight less than 5.3. That's weird because that's not the same number as we just calculated. 
but anyway, my point is that for this particular question, if you are recognizing binomial, that's excellent because it would be binomial, except he made a different choice in what question to ask. Of course, you do have to go back to the binomial CDF and find out what is the probability of a male cat having less than 5.3 kilograms. But then the answer to this question will be just 80 times B. And you really don't need the binomial distribution for that. But it is the expected value of a binomial distribution. It's N times P. So the N is the number of trials, which in this case is 80. And P is the probability of success. Success in this case is having a small cat, which I didn't calculate, but it's this number I called P. Okay, so what happens next in letter C might as well be a completely different question because the female cats have a different weight distribution. So I've started over with all of the same things that I do. F is the name of the, my random variable. It's the weight of a female cat. F has this normal distribution. He didn't exactly ask me for the probability of one female cat being bigger than 462, but I know I am going to need that because that's kind of what the next question is about. So I've calculated that, stored it in my variable called B by using the store button and the alpha button here to get to the letter B like I showed you before. But on paper, I'm just going to write the three significant figures, which is 0 0.395. That is not the end of this question because that's not what he asked. He's choosing actually 10 female cats. I thought it was going to be 80 but it's 10 female cats are chosen at random, find the probability that exactly one of them has a big weight. So that is a repetition of trials. Again, the trial is weighting the cat and the repetitions are 10. He's doing this to 10 cats. So haven't used the name X for any variable yet in this problem, so I'm doing that now. X is the number of large females. X is distributed as a binomial distribution because it is a repetition of trials. He is repeating the trial 10 times and the probability of success, the probability of having a large cat is 0 0.395 that was just calculated. Now the third line that I always write is what is the question being asked? The question is what is the probability that the number of large females x is exactly equal to 1? And this probability, I am going to calculate with the binomial PDF. But I just really wanted to stress in terms of writing things down, I always do these three things. Name the variable, say its distribution, and then ask the probability question and answer it. Again, name the variable, say its distribution, ask the probability question, and then I'm going to answer it by getting into the distributions menu, binomial PDF here, 10 trials. The probability was a variable that I called B. The X value is one because I want one large cat. And then the answer is 0 0.0429, which in three significant figures would be 0 0.0430. But the question isn't over yet because there is a part D where he is going to put all of the cats together, the 80 males and the 80 females. And I'm finding this question a little unusual because he keeps changing the number that he's interested in. So just now we were working with 4.62 kilograms and now we are working with 4.7. That's unusual. He tends not to have us do the exact same thing multiple times. And right now I've already used normal CDF to calculate something straightforward like four or five times in this question. So while that is unusual, it is something that I'm comfortable with. So I've collected all of the information that I think I'm going to need for part D here. I have the two different normal distributions for male and female. And for each one of them, I have calculated the probability of that cat being more than 4.7 kilograms. Now, what he is asking us this time is a conditional probability question, which is made evident by the use of this word given. And of course, it's not 100% of the times that he uses the word given that it is conditional probability, because it only means that he's giving you information. But 
very, very often in this type of question, he's giving you information in order to ask a conditional probability question. And it is the case here, because given that the cat is big, uh, he wants to find the probability that it was a female. So I know that there is a formula in the booklet for conditional probability, but this situation is particularly simple. So let me just do it the way that I like it, which is by writing a table of all four possibilities. The cat is either male or female, and the cat is either big or small. We have already calculated the probabilities of the cat being big in both cases, male or female. And there is a factor that simplifies this particular problem, which is that exactly half of the cats are male and half are female. So he has 160 cats, that's 80 plus 80. So when I'm looking for what number to put here, which is the cats that are male and big, it's just going to be half of that number over there. So in other words, 99% of the cats are big, but it's not 99% of all cats. It's just 99% of half of the cats, which gives us the 0 0.499. And then the rest of the male cats, in order to finish the 0 0.5 that I need in that column, the rest of them are small. And I know that looking at it this way, the digits 1, 2, 8 don't seem to make sense. But that's because on the screen, I am just typing everything with three significant figures, while in reality, I'm doing the calculations with a lot more significant figures. So now I've done the same thing with the female cats as well. And the question was, given that the weight was big, so we are interested in this line of the table here. Now, out of those large cats, we are interested in the probability that it was female. So female and big is 0 0.164, which like I said, turns out to be exactly what you get if you just use the formula. I just really wanted to do that. Okay, so the third problem, pause the video and read the problem. It is about something that was studied reaction times in two different groups of people. It's about being younger or older, but that doesn't matter. The point is that if you have two groups of people and you are studying the same thing in those two separate groups. It is the exact same thing as we were just doing with the cats, where we had two groups, male and female, and we were studying one thing in those groups, which was the weight. So that is the exact same kind of setup here. We have two groups, which is the older and the younger, and we're going to study the same thing on both groups, which is the reaction time. So this question is also about conditional probability, at least part A. So he is also telling me that 38% are in group X, which means that the X column needs to add up to 38%, making this problem slightly more complicated than the cat one because the cats were 50 here, 50 there. Okay, so what's happening in the question? A randomly selected participant has a reaction time greater than 0 0.65. So greater than is going to be this first row here and he wants the probability that it's in group x which is this cell here so this is a conditional probability question where he did not use the word given okay so he just stated a randomly selected participant has a reaction time greater than this he did not use the word given but he is giving you the information so that's what matters it's not the word it's the situation where he gave you some information and he's asking you for something else based on that. Okay, so the probability of a participant in group X being bigger than 0 0.65 reaction time, that's easy to find because I have both parameters for the X normal distribution. So I'm just going to use the normal CDF for that question. So that number turns out to be 0 0.0107. And in order to know what to put in the green cell there, I need to multiply that by 38%. Now, as for the probability of a participant in group Y having a big reaction time, which I need in order to fill in the cell to the right of that number, um, that is more difficult to find because the question didn't give me the standard deviation for that distribution, which is why I put a question mark here. Now, let me explain what happened here. This was actually my mistake because I selected different parts of the questions that I wanted to show in the video and I didn't realize that I had cut out 
a previous item that would give me some more information and ask me to calculate that standard deviation. Okay, so I don't have that information anymore for what the question wanted to be that number. So I am just going to make something up here so that we can continue, which looks a lot like cheating and it is, but it's also a good strategy that you can use sometimes uh, in the middle of exams. If you don't know how to solve a part, but you need it for later parts, just make something up and keep going with that number so that you can get some follow through marks for the rest of your work. Just try to make up numbers that are somewhat reasonable, okay? So I made up 0 0.02 for this probability here, multiplied it by the 62% of participants that are in group Y, which gave me 0 0.0124 here. And now the question which was talking about the case where the reaction time was big, now he wants the probability of the participant being from group X, which is the green cell up there and then putting the numbers into the formula, we get the answer to part A would be 0 0.247. And now to get us back to actually the main theme of the video, part B is going to be about binomial distribution using this number 0 0.247 as a probability. 10 of the participants are selected at random. This is repeating the experiment. The experiment was something about the reaction time of a participant, and now he's asking about 10 participants and asking a probability question about at least two of them. So it's two out of the 10 repetitions doing something, something that is perfectly a description of a binomial distribution question. So let's make sure that what he wants is actually for us to use the answer from part A, because the previous question was all over the place asking us for new numbers all the time. Uh, but this time, the 10 participants that were selected were participants with reaction times greater than 0 0.65. And this matches perfectly with the previously randomly selected participant that he was talking about in part A, who also had a reaction time greater than 0 0.65. So that's the same. And the probability that we calculated for that one participant was the probability that he was in group X. That's also the same question as we are asking in part B, the probability that the two of them are in group X. So yes, it is the same situation. We just have to phrase it as a binomial distribution now. So in this case, I've already used the letters X and Y, so I'm using G for group, okay? G is the random variable that answers the question, how many of those 10 selected participants with big reaction times were actually from group X? So that is a binomial distribution. The number of repetitions is 10 because 10 participants were selected. And the probability of success is going to be 0 0.247 because that is the probability that each one of the 10 was from group X. That is a number that is directly the answer to the previous item, putting this back into the main structure of a lot of questions that start by asking things about normal distributions and then end up asking binomial distribution questions. In this case, he is asking about at least two being in group X. So that is G more or equal to two. So that's at least two. And like we've discussed before, the binomial CDF only goes to the left side. So if what you want are the ones from two to the right, then the ones that you don't want are just zero and one, which means that what you want is everything except, so one minus the probability that G is less or equal to one, because less or equal to one is exactly the zero and one that you don't want. And then using the calculator, the answer that I got for that was 0 0.250. I think it was actually 2500, which is a surprisingly round number for a wrong answer coming from a made up number for one of the intermediate questions. Okay, so let's do one last problem to wrap up the video. And this one has a similar problem as the previous one where I remembered to write down the information that the mean was 106, but I forgot to include the part of the question where he has us find the standard deviation. 
So I did calculate it. It's 5.59. I'm just not going to show you how to do that in this video, but I promise to talk about this in a future video. So for now, I am just summarizing the information that I have about the normal distribution. The weight of one apple is normally distributed with mean 106 and 5.59. You can consider this as given information from the problem because it was found in previous items. And then this item B asks us to find the probability of the apple being smaller than 95. I used the normal CDF in my calculator to find this number of 0.0245. And then the next part of the question says that the apples are packed in bags of 10. So now I have 10 apples, which is repeating the experiment of weighting the apple. So now we have a binomial distribution. He gives a name, small to the apples that we were just talking about, the ones that have a mass of less than 95. So now we have a new random variable, which I'm calling x, which is the number of small apples in the bag that is distributed as a binomial with 10 repetitions because the bag contains 10 apples, and the probability of 2, 4, 5, which is the probability of one apple being small. The probability question that he's asking is that the bag contains at most one small apple, which lucky for us this time, it is the easy case of the binomial CDF because it's already X less or equal to one. And in the calculator, I found this number of 0 0.976. But what this question is also doing is that now it has a part D, which after having already put the apples inside of bags, now he is putting the bags inside of crates. So a crate contains 50 bags of apples. So yes, 50 is a new number in this problem, which I told you should make you suspect of a binomial distribution. And that's exactly it. He is interested in a number of bags that contain at most one small apple, which is the same kind of bag that we were studying in part C, bags that contain at most one small apple. So again, he's talking about the same probability, but now instead of one bag, it's 50 bags. So that probability that we just found of 976, that's going to become the parameter for a new binomial distribution that we're going to use in part D. So I'm using a new letter, which I haven't used the letter Y for a random variable in this problem before. Again, don't repeat the variable. X is very tempting, but we have already used an X in this problem. So use another letter like Y. And I said what I mean by the variable Y, which is the number of good bags. And he did not really use this term good, but I'm using this term to mean contains at most one small apple, right? We don't want the small apple. So if the bag only has at most one, like no small apples or at just one small apple, that's a good bag. And the probability that he wants is also something very good. He wants at least 48 bags to be good. So most of the bags are good. So in other words, he is asking for the number of good bags to be at least 48. So Y is the number of good bags. So the probability of Y is bigger or equal than 48. Once again, in my number line, I can see that I want 48, 49, and 50. So it's everybody is one except four, so I'm subtracting. And the probability of y being less or equal 47 is what I'm going to put in the binomial CDF in my calculator. And I know I am stressing a lot this thing about the binomial CDF only going to the left because that's the way that the TI-84 does it, right? That's the calculator that I'm using. I am aware that this may be calculator specific and that different brands and different models may not even have this issue. But anyway, that was not even the main point of the video. I just wanted to give you a bunch of examples of this question structure of having a normal distribution somehow turning into a binomial distribution halfway through the problem, because I think that that is very common in exams. So I hope this has been helpful and that you are going to be able to recognize it when it happens in the next questions that you run into.